Right now I'm at a thought um, called BWiki, which I just entered this morning because as I do every day I, I process my email. And uh, one of my friends had, uh, was asking whether he should invite some friends who were starting a company called BWiki into this particular um, session. And sorry guys, I'm, I'm, I may be outing your company, but that's okay. You have a, a coming soon page uh, on the web anyway. And so I added it to a thought called Wikivariant. So as I click on Wikivariant, you'll see here these are um, the various kinds of wikis that I've found over time. So, and I'll explain as I go how the brain works just for those of you who have very little um, experience with the brain. So every node is called a thought. Uh, thoughts can have one or more child thoughts. Those are these down here below the active thought. They can have one or more uh, parent thoughts. Those are these above. And also one or more jump thoughts. And that's this lateral connection. Really, really there's only two kinds of connection, up, down, and left, right. Because when I click on, wiki tw when I click on wikis, for example, wiki variants now becomes a child thought. Uh, and they, we just kind of keep moving up and down that way. What you put above or below any thought is up to you. There's no, there's no structure um, inherent to the brain. It's a little bit like a wiki in the sense that um, how you structure it is completely up to you. So some of what I want to show you is the different cliches or the different ways that I have uh, begun using the brain. And what I'll do is I'll just show a couple things, and then Shelley um, has a few questions to ask which I can answer, and then we'll take some questions from you guys. So um, down here at the bottom is the history list. So this is actually, these are the thoughts that I've been clicking on recently. So if I want to go back to Wikivariants, I just click on Wikivariants. And that's pretty easy. Um, my brain is full of not just business stuff, because I deal, I'm a technology analyst, so these are, these are tech companies, but I have a whole bunch of things. So if I click up here at the top of the screen, this is called the pin board. And any thought that I drag up here will stay up here. So this is a thought called Words I Love, and it's got a whole lot of things in it like mastery and play and practice and presence. And just to show you a little bit about what happens, I'll click on mindfulness. And uh, I'll wait a second while it refreshes. Uh, by the way, these are parent thoughts. These thoughts over on the right with a scroll bar, you'll notice the scroll bar here. These thoughts on the right are siblings of the current active thought, which means they are children of a common parent. So presence has as its children mindfulness and over on the right finding your location and glancing, for example. So uh, we'll, go, we'll go follow those around a little bit more. But, but notice the scroll bar because that's just into the G's and, uh, G's and H's. So if I go to mindfulness and then I can go down to Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, uh, and I can look at uh, deep listening and loving speech. I can look at a variety of things. And then um, I can follow this back up into something like spiritual writers. So here's Stephen Batchelor, Jennifer Cobb, uh, Eckhart Tolle, Marianne Williamson, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that would take us back up to my bibliography, for example. And at some point pretty early in fleshing out my brain, I decided that I was adding a lot of books. And I decided to, and this was just uh, the way I did it, I decided to attach the authors, not the books themselves. So I always have books under authors. So here I would have um, uh, authors like Dwayne Elgin, uh, David Barsamian, et cetera. And then at some point uh, in the early brain, you could only have 256 child thoughts under any particular um, thought. So uh, I started subcategorizing, which actually turned out to be really helpful. So I have here ethicists. And most of these people have actually written books. Uh, so here's Peter Singer, an ethicist. Uh, he wrote about animal liberation. Uh, rethinking Life and Death, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are other links under here as well. They're, on, they're not all books. Uh, there was a scandal at Princeton about, uh, about him. I don't even remember putting that in the brain. So that, that's one of the things that begins to happen. And, and Shelley, I just did a, a statistical count. I've got 86,600 thoughts right now with over 154,000 links between them. Wonderful. I'll have to adjust our press release. Well, if you can have a real-time count maybe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> So I've been doing this consistently for the last 10 years. Uh, I remember the day that Harlan actually showed me the brain for the first time, and I was like a duck in water. I thought, wow, this is exactly the kind of thing I need. Instead of bookmarks, this is a way I can keep track of what's going on. And I began feeding my brain and then gardening it. So I garden it a little bit all the time. And I'll show, um, I'll show one more uh, thought and then the, the, the thoughts around it, uh, just to show you a couple more features. And then we'll go to Shelley's questions. And uh, that will take us deeper into, into the whole session. So down on the left here, there's a search box. In fact, if I click anywhere on the background of the brain, if I just click once now, 
it puts my cursor in the search box, and then I can just start typing C K L E I N E R, and all of a sudden I'm at Kleiner Perkins. If I if I hit my down arrow once and then hit enter, I have just jumped through the 86,000 thoughts to whatever thought I know how to write. And uh, one of the nifty new features in in the the brain right now, it used to be that I had to know exactly how the thought began, so that this auto type. Uh, would only start at the beginning letter. Now it will actually identify any characters in uh, a thought name, which is really handy because sometimes I don't remember everything. Sometimes I, I take a couple of different paths to find something. In fact, sometimes when I have trouble finding a thought, what I'll do is I'll be persistent and find the thought, and then I'll remember what was the first thing I, I thought of in order to look for this thought, and I will then build new links that take me to that particular connection. I will make the new connection so that next time I can find it better, more easily. So here's Planner Perkins, which is a venture capital firm. In fact, I have a whole bunch of VC firms here, Draper Fisher, Hummer Winblad, uh, Moore Davidow. These under VC firms are actually sort of the blue chip firms. Then I have um, uh, other VCs, which is a thought I started at one point. And notice that there's a scroll bar here, right? So these are the Fs, these are the Ns. Well, remember, there used to be a limit of 256 thoughts under a thought. So then I have even more VCs and so on and so forth. And now I've actually been putting them all under here because that limit has gone away. So I just keep feeding even more VCs is where I put them. But I keep the blue chip firms up here. So let me go back for a moment to, to Kleiner Perkins. So under Kleiner Perkins are some of the partners, Rick Byers, Floyd Kwame, John Doerr, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the left, I use these jump links as service links. So for a company, let's say Extensity. For a company, I would have the category above them. So Extensity is a, I don't even know if they're still around. We can, if we click on this icon right here, we can go to the web, but I don't want to do that right this second. Um, but they're in the time and expense management field, which means if I click there, I can see who else was in that field. Concur Technologies, Free Timesheet, Portable Software. I have a subcategory called Timekeeping, Human Clocks, Kinetics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but let me go back to Extensity for a second. Under it, I have some of the principals, Bob Spinner, Sharam Sassan. I have no idea what's happened to them. Uh, often what will happen later is as a new startup comes up and I put in the new person's name, it will turn up that I know two or three startups that they had before just because they're in here linked up properly in my brain. So I'll go, oh, now I know that they tried to run this company and that company. And then notice to the left here that they, they got money from Kleiner, but they also got money from Hummer Winblad. And if I click on Hummer, You'll see their portfolio over here on the left with its own scroll bar. And this is not their entire portfolio of investments. These are just the companies that I happen to be interested in and knew who were Hummer Investments. So let me go back to its extensity. And they also got public relations from Outcast Communications. So if I click on Outcast, now you'll see the same, the same thing happens here. Karen Marooney, Tim Turpin, Margaret Winmachers. Here are clients of Outcast. So they represented Quoka Sports, Respond, Upshot, Blink, Amplitude Software. They're, of course, under other PR companies, and there's a huge number of PR companies in my brain. And if I go to any one of these companies, if I don't remember what Blink does, they do video search. They were hot in 2007. Uh, in fact, the category was hot in this year. And they're also an autonomy licensee. So if I go up here, I can see Autonomy Inc., which is a neural network vendor that got, had representation from Edelman. And here, you know, Mike Lynch was the principal, and so on and so forth. So let me stop here and go to, go to Shelley um, and uh, uh, take me through some of the questions and that'll, that will flesh out more of, the, uh, more of the details of what I've been doing. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, there is a flurry of questions. So what I'm going to do is start off with the, the more basic questions and uh, we'll uh, certainly get to, to everyone's questions. And I, I, Jerry, what I wanted to do was start off uh, was just by way of, of purpose. Um, your brain is, is very extensive, and it has so many intri in, uh, intri intricacies and interconnections. Um, why, uh, when you first saw the brain and, and met with Harlan in, in 1998, um, how were you organizing your information before personal brain? And why do you use personal brain? What specific benefits do you gain by organizing and accessing your information in personal brain as opposed to, um, you know, anything else um, that, that's out there? Sure. I'm, I'm not a 
tremendously organized person in real life, but I believe that the things I've seen are really important and I want to keep them in a context. So as long as I've had a PC or a Mac, um, I had an Apple II Plus in 1981, and pretty much as long as I've used computers, I've been trying to use different tools to collect up this information and leave it at hand. I was a very avid user of HyperCard back in the day when Apple still even supported HyperCard. And I hacked my own little HyperCard stacks, and I used to use it to search through things. But you couldn't really link, uh, link between things or make things very visual in HyperCard. Um, I used Echo, a PIM for a while. It was a PC PIM when I moved off the Mac to PCs. Uh, when I joined Esther Dyson in 92, um, I used Echo for quite a few years until email shows up, and Echo never figured out how to do email. And Echo had some wonderful list-oriented um, uh, capabilities, and yet there was nothing visual there at all. Um, those, and, then I, and then I switched to Outlook, and Outlook, um, Outlook is mostly brain dead. It's a, it's a reasonable uh, uh, mail client, and it's got a pretty good contact list, but things like groups, any kind of linkages inside, the task list, the to-do list are all basically unusable. So um, what happened when I found the brain, when Harlan uh, and uh, Don came and presented, was that I had been trying to maintain bookmarks in my browser. And that, that was kind of the last frontier there of, of just trying to be sort of organized in the bookmark managers. And the bookmark managers of the time for the, I don't remember whether it was uh, Netscape or, or still Mosaic at the time. I think the Netscape browser was out and I think IE was out, um, were pathetic. They were really bad. And they were, of course, hierarchical. And uh, moving things around was very difficult and so forth. And all of a sudden, this was a brilliant way to do that task. So the benefit I've gotten from using it all the time, I went right here to uh, an email I got this morning from my friend Chris Carfee who put out a video about uh, Facebook Beacon. So I just went in my brain to Chris Carfee. Here's his blog, The Social Customer Manifesto. And I'm just going to drag the new thought in that I just saw today down under it. And now I have a new thought called, um, here we go, Privacy Improvements and 90-second Interview. Let's trim that up a little bit. Facebook Beacon, great. Customer Manifesto, take away this label. And now I've basically captured this video that Chris did. And in fact, what I can do is link that up to Facebook Beacon, which I already have in my brain. So this is the benefit, is that every morning or whenever I, I see something that's interesting, um, I build links. And now I have a long-standing context into which I link all new information. This is hugely different from doing a mind map of, you know, on the spur of the moment as a brainstorming exercise. And I was a user briefly of inspiration. I've tried Mind Manager and a couple others that are sort of paper oriented. But I found that any time I got to the edge of the paper, I was dead. I just couldn't do anything. And I found the value of being able to link into everything I know all in one place. And I know that sounds kind of big, but it sort of is. I've, I've really I've put 10 years of work into this. Um, is enormous. So I can tell you that Peter Thiel, is a PayPal alum that he's invested in Blip TV, Facebook, Friendster, LinkedIn, Vader TV, and Zoom. I go up to PayPal alumni. I can get, then go through Premal Shah, Reid Hoffman, uh, Sanjay. But this is really hard to do in a database. Well, I'm remembering I played some with a couple databases too along the way. This is very, very difficult to do in a database, and it's transparently easy to me here. So um, next question. All right. Well, Jerry, um, we've had a couple questions about how you manage so many thoughts um, um, and where you manage. There's a question about where you manage your favorites or I guess your most used thoughts and also how you deal with duplication and avoiding redundancy with that number of thoughts. So the brain has a, a, a feature I, I refer to as local structure. I just went to that in my brain. Uh, so does the web. And by local structure, I mean that every screen full makes sense to me, but it doesn't need to make sense always. It doesn't need to be perfectly consistent all the way throughout the brain. So when you go to my website and click on a link that goes to a different website, your brain knows enough to begin reading the new website for its context and its organizational patterns and the way its, its author is trying to express what goes on there that site will have local structure, as did hopefully mine. And some sites are better than others at that, right? That's what uh, user interface or user experience design is all about. But in the brain, I find that 
I constantly am, am improving each screenful as I go look at it. And I, I think, well, gosh, I should subcategorize this, or I should link this up to something I just learned, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this capability of, of my appropriating it at will at any time, and my being able to adapt new thoughts, add new ideas, do whatever else, um, is really the, the, the big payoff here for me. And sorry, it, it was a, you had a multi-part question. I've forgotten the last part. Um, and the, the question was just about um, beyond sort of how you manage that number of thoughts and uh, is duplication. How do you, with that number of thoughts, ensure you're not creating another thought on web rings or wikis in 1995 somewhere else? Um, thank you. So when I've learned after a while that when I'm putting in a new company or a new thought, first I search for it to make sure I don't have it. If, if I were to enter it spelled exactly the same, the brain will notify me that there's a duplicate thought. And if I put a URL, if I drag a URL into the brain, um, for instance, if I were to drag this URL in now, it says, oops, you've already got that. So do you want to go see that? So no, I don't want to add that brain, and I don't want to activate where that, where that thought was. So it will warn me about duplicates. I'm actually really particular about the namespace, so about what, I, what I've named all the thoughts. And you'll notice that I, even though the brain now includes an uppercase uh, spell checker so that it'll, it'll try to uppercase each letter of a thought, I've always done that. So you know, top of my mind was always this way. That's one of my oldest, uh, oldest thoughts. And then I'll, I'll have thoughts about, um, you know, here's my event schedule, for example, how I keep organized about where I'm going. Uh, things that are pink are basically private events. Things that are uh, in white are, are public. Uh, when I do publish my brain, which I need to refresh the brain that's online right now, but all of this would just go up. Um, and I, I find that when I blog, I'm more worried about duplicating, gosh, did I blog about this before, than I am in my brain because I know that I'll get near enough. And every now and then I'll have an event where I discover that I've put the same thing in a couple times in, near, in nearby places, and then I'll just consolidate those thoughts once I find them and once I've figured that out. I just a couple days ago I found out that I had the same individual in two different places, so I consolidated him. Um, but it, does, it just doesn't happen that often. So, I have this really wonderful confidence that as I'm wandering through my brain, it's not that duplicative. Um, and I also had the fear originally back 10 years that there would be parts of my brain over time that would be like the dark forest, the part of my brain that I just don't want to go into because it's so messed up that, that it's not working anymore. There aren't any. There are parts of my brain that are not as well organized as I would like, like the wireless applications and communications gear section of my brain I know is not that well organized. But I can still find stuff in there, and I know who the players are, and I can get around it. And whenever I go back in, I do a little more gardening. So I haven't, I haven't in some sense written off large portions of this brain because they became unusable because of that complexity. So I think that speaks to the fact that at least one person sort of working through it uh, for this time uh, could still feel perfectly comfortable uh, after 100 thoughts or after 1,000 or after 86,000. And Jerry, can you take us back, you know, 10 years ago when you just got started, and what areas did you start building out, and was it a particular passion or hobby or work project that um, got you into the brain, or where, where are some of your historical thoughts, and, and how did they start to, to grow and, 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 and link, link to other things? Sure. So... Originally, the suggestion was, and I don't remember whether Harlan made the suggestion or whether this was just in the, in the software's early startup, is that why don't you just start with your name, call your brain Jerry, which I did, uh, and then start with business and personal. So I think these three are probably the first, first, three, um, the first three thoughts I ever put in. If I go to, is it details? Here we go. Uh, so um, this is when I put in December 18, 1997 at 4.04 PM. Internal wow. two. Okay. And then business over here, I put in December 19, 2006. Uh, let's go back up. Personal, uh, uh, here we go, December 18, 1997 at 4.05. So um, those, that's sort of where I started. And I don't go back here that much. So I don't go back into this area. I'll use the word personal, for example, to talk about personal versus personalized, and I'll do that. But I really don't go back to this area so much. That just became a starting point. And it's territory that I don't go back to very often. Um, then over time, I created all sorts of things. So uh, for example, um, I have a, a thought here called New Science Alumni. I used to work at a company called New Science Associates. 
So what I ended up doing was I created alumni thoughts for any company that, that I was talking about, uh, that I put in my brain, where I began to know people and where people started leaving the company. And that, then it dawned on me that, gosh, I, had, um, I should maybe collect, collect these together. So I actually, under alumni, I have all of these alumni thoughts linked up to alumni. So here's IDEO alumni, people who've left IDEO, the design firm, Rajat Paharia, Abe Adekola, Charles Warren, who's now at Google, et cetera, et cetera. So if I click on Charles, you'll see that he used to be at IDEO, he used to, uh, you know, he used to have a company called BSW Group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he is now a Googler, and here are all these Google people. Right? This is Google staff, and then these are Google alumni. So that's just another little um, wandering. Sorry to wander afield from your question a little bit, but uh, these are some of the things that I, that I developed over time. Okay, great. And then in terms of your, your key thoughts, and maybe those are just your, your pins at, at the top of your screen, what are your most used or sort of those Archimedean points uh, within your brain, Jerry, um, are there specific uh, sections within your brain where you find that you're spending uh, more time than others or um, areas that, that get more developed and are more useful to you? And if so, uh, can you show us these areas? Yeah, I, I think my usage is relatively even across the brain. So these days, uh, there's a lot going on with Facebook. Uh, notice that it takes me three, three seconds really to move to Facebook. So um, there's a lot of stuff that I'm just adding into Facebook apps. So, so, so these days, the Facebook application directory and all the new little Facebook apps, and I only have a few of them here because there are thousands, that would be a popular place right now. Um, in general, my event schedule I use a lot because when, I'm, when I have a speech to do in the future, I'll put it out here. And then notice that each, I've, I've figured out that each year I actually collect up all the thoughts and put them into an older uh, thing. And then I also name the thoughts so that they will sort properly, so that they will collate in sequence. So uh, 07 is the year, 10 is the month. I don't put the date in. Uh, so these things will sort of cluster together in the right order for me. And that, that's just you know, using the software a little bit, using the software's default to try to make a little more sense. Now, if I go to um, my favorite thought in my entire brain, that's this one called enumerated wisdom. And it'll make sense in just a second. In fact, in fact, uh, if you go to my online brain, there's a, a thought called good starting points, which I created sort of for this tour. So here's enumerated wisdom. And it's, of course, under wisdom, which has a whole bunch of other stuff. It's also under lists. But uh, here are the three P's of learned optimism. So if I click on that, we'll go to learned optimism, which is under Marty Seligman, uh, and that is permanence, personalization, and pervasiveness. And I think this one I just put in last week. Uh, the three rules of the tipping point. And this would go up to, and this, is another, this will highlight a really wonderful thing about using the brain, which is that once I read the tipping point, I debriefed the tipping point into my brain. Right? So here's the magic number 150, which is uh, comes out of grooming gossip and the evolution of language, and uh, should be linked to the Dunbar number. Here we go, Dunbar's number. So let's go back up to the tipping point. Then here are the three rules of the tipping point, stickiness factor, law of the few, and the power of context. If I go to the law of the few, here are connectors, mavens, and salesmen. If I go to connectors, um, here's my friend David Eisenberg, Joey Ito. Ito. In the book, he talks about Lois Weiss. Roger Horschow, and Paul Revere. So they're all here as well. And Paul Revere is a silversmith and is part of the American Revolutionary War, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great. And then um, we have a question, Jerry, about how much uh, time on average a day or week you spend uh, on or in your brain. So it's always open. And I use it constantly. So I'm, I'm always looking around in it, always doing stuff with it. It's hard for me to say what sort of time that involves. Um, and every now and then I'll get into some you know, ADD moment where I start following a couple links and I realize I needed to fix this over here. And I get curious about this thing I meant to read you know, a couple months ago. And suddenly a couple hours have gone by. And I'm sort of you know, a, little, a little better educated, but those two hours I'm not going to get back. Uh, but in general, it's hard for me to say how much time exactly I'm putting in. The good news is that to add a thought to my brain is a matter of 20 seconds, and to look something up is a matter of 5 or 10 seconds if I've linked it well or if it's searchable easily, which is generally the case. 
And I think that actually saves me an enormous amount of time because I have better access to the breadcrumbs in my life than most people do. I find also that looking in my brain for things and wandering near thoughts that were important to me or as I put things in refreshes old neural pathways in my wet brain, the one in my head. So as I'm actually using the brain um, and looking at, looking at particular links or particular contexts or you know, local structure in different areas, I remember better who the various players were in some industry or what this person did or whatever else. That is then refreshed over and over again for me. And I find that repetition is actually good for me when I'm just standing away from my brain in conversation because I can then rattle off a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know I remembered. Excellent. And uh, we have a, a question um, from Barton about how, uh, who would like to know how you would summarize how the brain has helped you enhance your own analytic or creative work. And uh, if you can take us to some of your, um, some of the thoughts in your brain that deal specifically with creativity. Sure. Um, so there's a, well, creativity is, uh, Innovation, creativity, a whole bunch of different things, you know, uh, creative industries, creative people. Um, what I'm thinking about is uh, at one point I was um, looking up Brian Arthur and his thoughts uh, on increasing returns dynamics. I was trying to find anything that was, um, that was actually uh, written well about this. And there, he, he, there actually isn't very much written about increasing returns dynamics, but there's this whole, this whole notion of virtuous circle, which I had under um, feedback in my brain. And I had not linked it to vicious cycles. But I went up to feedback and I looked around and it dawned on me and I, I had different resolutions so it was easier to read all the different thoughts. Again, remember that. So it, it dawned on me that when one company has a virtuous circle so that Microsoft Office starts to get all the corporate corporations on board to start using Microsoft Office, everybody else in that market was in a vicious cycle. That everybody else ended up, you know, losing all their market share because companies would no longer buy their product, or you know, name your other vicious cycle. So that was an insight that I got, um, which may be obvious to, to some of you on the call, but I, I hadn't thought that through just from seeing what was nearby in my brain. Uh, then I have a lot of things about innovation, lots and lots, because there are all sorts of innovation labs. Uh, chief innovation officers and in companies. In fact, if you go there, I have you know uh, senior executives, chief privacy officers, security officers, technology officers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are innovation labs, innovation techniques, uh, innovation psychologists, believe it or not, um, some people who are innovators, uh, serial innovators, lead customers. Uh, this whole notion from uh, sorry, lead users is the notion from Eric von Hippel at MIT. Uh, and so on and so forth, I find that I can cluster together, um, uh, so for example, my beliefs. I can cluster together things that I think about uh, and things that I uh, believe in nicely here so that I can encapsulate them and review them and garden them and improve them. So that helps me focus um, a lot of, of what's in my brain in useful ways. And, and again, because this is not hi a hierarchical map, because it's, uh, I can randomly add, I can just, um, I can go from my beliefs and I can add, you know, new thought here, and I've just added a new thought called new thought here. Notice how the brain now auto automatically gives it caps. Um, and then I can, I can kill that thought just by highlighting it and saying delete. And I just, you know, made a, I just made and, and deleted the thought. I can also make and delete random links between um, uh, any sort of thoughts I want. So when I get a new idea that starts to crystallize, I can begin to do that. Um, I can also pull together bibliographies and sub-bibliographies about a particular topic or for a particular project. That's actually helpful as well. Okay, great. And Jerry, I get where, um, uh, for those of uh, the attendees that aren't familiar exactly with your line of work, I got a couple private IMs about what exactly your primary occupation is. Um, so you could tell us a little bit more background on yourself and then how the brain helps you uh, with your business. Sure, and I meant to say that as part of an answer to one of your earlier questions, which is I've been a tech industry analyst since uh, about uh, 1987. 
So I've been in, in the tech business uh, writing about trends and companies in the future and um, all those sorts of things. So the first things I began to pour into my brain were all the companies I was covering. That's why there's so much technology stuff in here. Um, over time, I'm, I've become an independent consultant. I went independent in 1998. I have a variety of projects, and I put project-oriented work in here. If it's private, I'll mark it private for me so it doesn't get published out. And uh, um, what else did I say about my background? And, and I'm also generally curious about way too many things. So I have some writing projects and other kinds of projects that, um, that all fit nicely in the brain because it's so broad that I can at the same time encompass the things that I really need to know for my daily work, like you know, how many buddy list uh, companies uh, are there, and also these more esoteric thoughts about everything else. So if a reporter calls me up and wants to write an article about Facebook or about buddy list, off the top of my head I can recall maybe a half dozen or maybe a dozen of the buddy list companies. Well, here's all of the ones I heard of about. So there's the V's, there's the Y's, Yahoo Messenger, Crossfire, Wired Red, uh, Web Messenger, Webby, et cetera, et cetera. All right, great. And Jerry, do you uh, use your brains for presentations? I know you do a, a lot of public speaking at, at various events and so forth. So yes, and what will happen is uh, it depends a bit on the audience and the context and how much time I have. Because I know that as soon as I start showing the brain, I need to spend five to ten minutes to explain what it is and how it is. And then it's, it's inevitably going to take us into some interesting discussions, which happens every time. So I had, a, I had the luxury of a three-hour speech in Minneapolis a year and a half ago as part of something called Master's Forum. Um, and so I gave a speech there um, where I began, basically my, my introduction was, I'm going to pretend like we're never going to meet each other and we only have these three hours. And I'm going to introduce myself very slowly. So I introduced myself by showing my brain and by walking through some of the thoughts that I was actually going to go through later in my presentation. And it worked really, really well. In the beginning of the, of the, the presentation it was more conversational. I got some questions from the audience. And they got to see a tool that I've used, you know, as, as, as I guess you can see, um, pretty intensely for a decade, and that does boil down a lot of the things that I care about um, over time. So. Um, I would like to do, um, in fact, uh, three or four years ago I was going to start doing, but I just got distracted by the project. I was going to do some uh, interactive brain uh, and audience performance pieces, a little bit like Spalding Gray's you know, Monster in a Box or his other monologues, but not as much monologue as um, talking to the audience, looking things up on the web, improving the brain during the presentation, so adding links that came out of the audience that you know, were suggestions or things I didn't know about, and then republishing the brain at the end of the performance so that everybody could go home and go to the, go to the brain data and link into it or see whatever was going on there. Uh, that's something I would actually still like to do. I just haven't put the energy into doing it. Interesting. And uh, we have a question from uh, Rich Miller about uh, your consideration of a single brain over multiple brains. Um, you know, what, what was the decision process there? Um, he himself has only used portions of his brain for publishing. Um, why did you decide to create one large brain as opposed to smaller brains? And do you have any other brains? Is this your only brain? Um, thanks. Hey, Rich. Um, Great question. And uh, at one point, I experimented. I did a little. I did a side brain on the periodic table of elements, and I started with the number one and hydrogen, and you know, so on and so forth, and sort of built down the num the numbers of uh, the numbers of the periodic table. And then I had rare earths and all this and all that. And that was sort of satisfying. And at that point, I already had I don't know twenty thousand thoughts in my normal brain. Um, and then I thought, why is this not in my normal brain? It wouldn't disrupt anything. It actually improves my brain. Um, it does, you know. And I, in fact, I put some of it in here. I didn't put, uh, I didn't put enough of it in here. Uh, but you'll see, there's a whole lot of stuff around periodic table of elements. Here's Mendeleev. Uh, here's the book Uncle Tungsten, which I recommend to anybody who wants to learn about the history of, of the periodic table, uh, which is written by the, the brilliant uh, writer Oliver Sacks. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I, then I, I decided long ago that it was a really fantastic benefit to put everything in one brain and to have a mixture of personal and business things all together, um, to not worry about whether this was in this brain or that brain, which is a, a problem I have these days with wikis. I use lots and lots of wikis. And wiki search um, tends to be inside of a particular wiki because many wikis are password-worded and not public. So it becomes difficult to figure out where did I put something. And uh, I think that, that the benefits of having everything collected up together really outweigh um, uh, the potential virtues of having different brains. Also, um, as I said earlier, the notion that something new shows up on my radar and that I can hook it into the vast context of things that I already know is for me the big aha. It's, and I, for some strange reason, I picture it as hanging ornaments on a Christmas tree. And each new news item or new thought or some, somebody tells me that they just changed companies. <clears throat> Another note um, this morning was from Bill Seitz, who might actually be on the call. <clears throat> and he, uh, he sent a note that he's just joined a company called Daily Lit. And he used to be with Living Independently, and he's now joined uh, Daily Lit. And Daily Lit is about reading books on a small dosage basis on, through SMS or in email. And that was interesting. I already had Daily Lit uh, in, my, in my brain. So uh, if, I were, if I had multiple brains, that would be much harder to contemplate. And that's right. And I think uh, one thing, we do get this question asked quite a bit, uh, bit in our 101 sessions, Jerry. Uh, you know, do I create one brain or multiple brains? And, uh, you know, just to add my two cents to that, uh, with the new copy and paste features of 4.0, um, you can really have your cake and, and eat it too. If you do start uh, with a single brain and you decide you need to, you know, uh, you want to take pieces of that out for publishing or to share with colleagues, uh, you can simply uh, copy and paste those thoughts into a new brain file and uh, go, ahead, go ahead and divvy things up. Um, generally speaking, uh, I think if you are moving quickly between uh, large groups of thoughts, it's better to keep them in a single brain, which is something that, of course, uh, Jerry is doing. And Jerry, just to move um, uh, into more of the feature aspect of the software, um, I had a couple questions for you on uh, what are some of your favorite features, and then um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and share your thoughts uh, with the group on Personal Brain 4.0 and any particular uh, features that you're using in the new version of the software as well. Mm -hmm. So one of my... Um, uh, one of my blog posts a long time ago is this thing I call the Law of Convenience, <clears throat> um, which is behind this link here. And it basically says, and I've written it in the notes here, um, every additional step, I'll, I'll unhighlight that, every additional step that stands between people's desires and the fulfillment of those desires greatly decreases the likelihood that they will undertake the activity. This is, this is why Amazon One Click is so interesting. Um, and in fact, a long, long time ago, Jeff Bezos credited um, either Esther or me, I couldn't tell which, um, with the idea for One Click. Um, and, and what I love about the brain, and this is for me its primary feature, is that it's so simple for me to use that the, the dragging motion of this thought into the brain and then just labeling it, putting it in the right place, being able to move around very quickly, also the, um, the, the, you know, the neural networks, for example, the very, very simple type down buffer has always been a magical, magical property because I didn't have to enter things blindly. It was really easy to find and then sort of find where to put things. And then also the non-hierarchical nature of the brain itself. So a lot of these things are not so much a particular feature as absolutely core design elements of the software that are essential to the way I use it and my, my satisfaction in using it. Um, now, PB4 is nifty because it's multi-platform. I've stayed on PCs for, uh, since 92 somewhat in, uh, in, in part because the brain didn't run on other platforms. So PB4 is now rewritten in Java, runs on Windows and Linux, which is great. Um, I am only beginning to understand the new features in personal brain. So the idea that I can you know, click on a, a gate and I can have a subset of thoughts selected and then I can go do something by right clicking um, on that subset of selection, I've only ever done this once or twice. So this is true confessions moment. I'm sort of so happy and so busy using the historical features of the net of the brain 
that um, I don't use a lot of the new features. Like I don't even use link typing. I'd be interested, but it, it, it uh, also, and I'll go back to the law of convenience. Adding thought typing and link typing every time I entered something would add another 20 or 30 seconds or maybe only 15 seconds to my data entry um, job, which actually would make it more difficult to add things. So the swiftness with which I can put things in. Now, something could easily be inferring that if it's a link into Amazon's book section, it's probably a book. Um, and you could look up whether there's an ISBN, ISBN number attached or an Amazon part, parts number attached or whatever else. It would be very easy to infer more things. And the brain is not inferring much at all. It's, there's no artificial intelligence in the brain. It's not, it's not busy trying to figure out who is this person and what do they do. Um, but I have found for my own uses that not using types and all those sorts of things has worked out really well. As I look ahead at the semantic web and web 3.0, whatever that might be, I'm really interested in, in experiments where um, those kinds of things might actually be folded in. Okay, and we had a question about the uh, the comma trick and whether or not you're using um, the the comma to uh, delineate the the names that you're creating within your brain. I sometimes do. I don't all that often because um, often I'm adding a list of people or something like that, and I want to confirm that a person is the same as a person. Let's say the name is John Miller. And there might be there might be several John Millers already in my brain. It's big enough, um, so I will be hesitant to add, <coughs> excuse me, um, a whole bunch of things in a string really quickly. I tend to want to double check to make sure I'm not making spurious links. But I do use it, and I like it. And uh, Jerry, we have a question for you regarding some of your more personal thoughts. And uh, feel free to uh, to take us or not take us into the area, these areas. Do you? Uh, the question is: Do you use your brain um, for your personal life, or is it strictly business? Um, very much for personal life in a lot of ways. Um, and if there's something personal, I just this little checkbox on the right says private, so I mark things private. Um, I probably disclose roughly the kind of stuff that a normal blogger would disclose on a blog here. And my brain is right now less publishable than your average blog, um, so it doesn't get seen as much. But I'm, I, when, as I put things into my brain, I do think about that. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it's very much a blend of the personal and the private. I mean, I'll, I'll go back to the words I love thought and, and how those things work, um, and then also words I'm not fond of. Um, people who know me will laugh, of course, when they see the word consumer here, and eyeballs, and content. Um, so I, I would say it's very, it's very much a blend of the two, and that being able to blend the two is a virtue, that it allows me to link techie stuff to softer stuff that I care about in a way that's very consistent and congruent with my beliefs and uh, the way I see the world. Interesting. And do you have any uh, private thoughts within your brain uh, before you publish? Which, of course, you don't have to take us through, Jerry. Sure. Well, um, I have a book that I've written and never published um, whose working title was Gullets with Wallets and Eyeballs. So all these sort of purplish um, thoughts here are private because it was an unpublished book. And uh, GWE is, is my shorthand for Gullets with Wallets and Eyeballs. So I have a you know GWE bibliography, which I actually made uh, a public thought because this is an interesting bibliography. And if GWE was mystical to people looking at the brain, that's okay. They, you know, they they can send me an email, which is, which would be great. And and by the way, I wanted to make sure that everybody has my email address. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them or whatever else. It's Jerry with a J at Sociate.com. Sociate is S as in Sam, O C I A T E, because I like to associate people and ideas. Clearly, um, so there's you know so in this area you'll see a whole lot of and in fact these are the major um, these are the major chapter breaks of the book draft etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, but, but great. I think, and I haven't done a count on how many private thoughts I have, but it's not that many. I try to I try really hard um, to make all thoughts public. Interesting. And uh, for those of you um, that uh, have, we're going to continue. Uh, Jerry, how are you doing for time? There are several more questions that uh, I want to get to in the session. I'm um, happy to go until we're out of questions. 
Okay, great. So uh, what I, for those of you that do want to go, though, I just want to make sure that you do have um, access. A couple of you have uh, IM'd about where you can go to navigate Jerry's Brain. Um, so you can get to Jerry's Brain off uh, associate.com, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and put that in the Q&A, and that's just spelled uh, S O C. A-I-T-E, associate.com, just like it sounds, and uh, get to his brain that way. And we also put a direct link uh, URL off of our site, thebrain.com forward slash Jerry's Brain, uh, that will get you there. Um, a lot of you um, have been having questions about how to get started and, and how do you even begin. Um, we're going to have Jerry talk a little bit about um, some getting started tips. And for those of you you that are out of town, time and want a little bit more in-depth on sort of level one, starting with, you know, two or three thoughts and then getting up to 84,000, uh, I just want to let everyone know that we do have Personal Brain 101, and that's every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, and it's designed specifically to help you get started and also look at any issues of your own brains that you might be dealing with. They're uh, interactive, and they're always different and productive, so feel free to, to sit on um, that session that we have at the end of this week. And then I guess, Jerry, what I'll do, um, if you have any sort of final notes to, or closing remarks um, that you want to give to the group as a whole before uh, uh, people start signing off, and then we'll move back to Q&A. Um, uh, we do have about five to seven more questions that uh, have come in through the, the panel. Fabulous. And uh, um, I, if anybody was watching while you were talking, Dean Collins had very kindly posted to the Q&A that Extensity is now part of Infor. So I, I looked up Infor in Google, um, added Infor to my brain, put it up under CRM at least as a placeholder. And that's what I do, is, is somebody will tell me something interesting um, with, for which I am always really grateful. I will then add it right into my brain and keep going. So um, I just did that as a demo. So here you can see info, info above extensity. And if I knew more, if I followed the link to the press release that uh, Dean had put up there, if I had more time, I might read that and I might realize that it was an acquisition. And then under extensity, I would put in um, you know, that they were acquired uh, and for how much and on what date. So um, the same thing that I do for, for alumni um, and for bibliographies, I do for acquisitions. So here I have you know, the companies that Intuit has bought. Oops, not that many. Uh, let's go to who's got a lot of uh, Cisco should have an all, uh, quite a few acquisitions. I'm not, really a, I'm not really a router guy, but here's a bunch of Cisco acquisitions, inclu including WebEx, which we're using now. Uh, I, sometimes after companies, I'll put the date they were founded, the year they were founded, I mean. Um, so this is just an example of one, one really quick and fascinating way to keep the brain updated. Sorry, go ahead. All right, interesting. Okay, well, we actually have a question, Jerry, from uh, Michael Bass, and Michael Bass is, uh, is attending from Germany. So, Michael, thanks for listening to us over your dinner. And uh, his question is, uh, uh, can we look at your statistics? So he was interested in, in your, the reports on your, your thoughts um, and wanted to, to see what sort of statistics you have. So I don't know if you want to go into your, the reporting tab and, and I guess uh, show us some of the analytics on your brain. I just hit the statistics things, and it will take about a minute to crank through and gen the little, uh, the little table, but I'll leave it up. Okay, excellent. Yes, we, we have a question from uh, uh, Diane. Uh, in the example of company alumni thoughts, under alumni, why did Jerry name the thoughts company one alumni, company two alumni, company three alumni, etc., instead of just having the thoughts say company one, company two, and company three? So I guess there's a question about your naming convention in alumni. Sure. So. Um, Originally, um, when I didn't have that many thoughts, I would have Cisco, and then I would put Cisco employees directly under Cisco. Well, I started having a lot of things under Cisco, and I didn't want the employees clouding um, what was going on. And then also, if an employee left Cisco, leaving them attached to Cisco didn't make that much sense because it wasn't that much information. So I created the convention that for companies where I have you know, more than two or three people linked under, I will generally create um, Cisco staff, and Cisco alumni, and I'll link those laterally off really often. 
So Cisco staff will then collect up all the people I know or have read about. And by the way, just because somebody's name is in my brain does not mean I know that person. This is not a, this is not a way to introduce uh, you know, anyone to anyone. Uh, most of the names in here I actually have never met. Um, but, the, but then having company alumni became a really nice way of collecting them all up because then you know, it's very consistent. And when I attach them all up to alumni, it works great. So unless I misunderstood the question, this just evolved out of um, having a few too many thoughts under the company itself. So it became ungainly in many cases. You know, imagine that I had product names, uh, divisions, initiatives, acquisitions, uh, staff, and alumni all collecting up under companies. I started having to have logical subdivisions, so I created these uh, cliches or patterns or whatever you want to call them. I guess now the sort of the free form where, where everything goes. So I'm going to ask some some other sort of rogue questions that have been popping in and out. And Jerry, one of them's from uh, Peter Dorfman, and the question is: Does having the brain make you money? <laughs> um, hi, Peter. Um, so n not really, and uh, <laughs> not, not directly. Part of it is, and and Harlan, we need to figure this out because we need to to get the the publishing cycle working so that I can actually have an updated brain all the time. My brain is big enough that that we need to take a, a few special measures, but. Um, it's not as visible as somebody's blog would be. And my blog suffers. I call myself a blog mute because I, I own a blog. I just don't blog very often. Um, so I'm not getting the word out which would attract business the way other people do. Uh, I don't get the word out on my blog, and I, put, I pour a lot of things into my brain. So, um, so in that sense, no. In another sense, it does because I've gotten a few projects because I was at a conference sitting in the audience, and somebody looked over my shoulder and saw me putting things in my brain and said, what's that? And that turned into a conversation, turned into a gig. Um, because I'm an independent consultant, and what I like to do is give speeches and give guided tours and you know, show people what, uh, how technology works and what's going on. So in that sense, yes. And I've had a few cases where I've been invited to you know, show my brain at, at conferences or presentations, and that's interesting. But very, very indirectly. So thanks for asking, Peter. Okay, great. And we have a question from Julian. Uh, have there been times when you thought that something you organized uh, – oh, I'm sorry, the panel, let me just read this again uh, – thought you organized some years previously needs a massive reorganization? If so, how did you go about it? So I've done I, – I can't think of any massive reorganizations that I've done. I've renamed thoughts. I've moved thoughts. You can easily grab a thought. You know, I can grab M&A firms here and bring it down under acquisitions. I won't do it right now. Uh, but, but it's pretty easy to, to move things around at, in the near term. Um, that's the kind of experiment I would do with my wireless, you know, wireless communication, uh, like wireless app platforms, for instance, exist in the middle of a bit of a morass, wireless data, cell phones, uh, wireless app developers, et cetera, et cetera. If I had the time, I would sit down and do a pretty big reorg here. But I can usually get to um, what I need. So, so I haven't. And, and I can't think back to any major, major reorg that I've done in the brain. It's, it's kind of, I guess what I'd say is that this method of successive approximations or the, the constant gardening, a little bit of a pun, on the movie um, actually pays off and works really well because I don't find myself uh, that separated from my own reality uh, very often. I, I, don't, I find that my brain generally mirrors uh, the way I see things and doesn't need big reorgs. And if, there, if somebody buys somebody, that's really easy because I don't have to move a lot of stuff. I just, you know, I just add them to the acquisitions list or whatever else. Okay, great. And for those of you um, that do have more questions or issues on editing your brain, we did a session last month called uh, Personal Brain 202, Editing and Massively Overhauling Brains. We are going to be doing a repeat of that session. Uh, the date is TVD, but it will be this month in December. So feel free to uh, email me at uh, shelley at the brain .com if you have any uh, questions on that session. 
And then I think um, ultimately the, the gardening approach that uh, Jerry has sort of talked about in the session is a good one. Um, and we do cover uh, massive overhauls. And I think just to add to what Jerry says, the ability to mass select uh, multiple thoughts in version 4 has been enormously helpful um, to me personally, um, because I, I do have areas in my brain that, are, um, that aren't quite as, as, as attractive as Jerry's that do need to be uh, reconstructed. So um, that's probably the way to go through the uh, mass editing capabilities. Also, there's another question that Samuel Harbin asked about the brain is integrated in, in, on uh, my Facebook page. Uh, Samuel, I'm sorry to disappoint you. That's just a, a screenshot. I only took a <laughs> screenshot of the brain to upload some kind of JPEG uh, for the, the invitation to today's session. It would be lovely if it integrated uh, in different ways. Great. And Jerry, um, we have a question uh, from Bob uh, Bloom about uh, if, whether or not you use the past thought list much to remind you of what your focus was at at a particular time. So do you mean the history list, this right here? Is that what the past? Is that what the past thought was? Yeah, just the, the scrolling breadcrumb trail by the search. Okay, good. That that is the, that's what I call yeah. the history list. Uh, mm -hmm. Every now and then I will. In particular, um, it's a very very handy way to be doing um, sort of tight tight work, close in work. When I'm trying to link, trying to add things and link things up really richly, I know that the last couple things I was on are right there on the history list, so I can link directly to them. So. It's, it's really easy, for, for instance, to take a, make a link to something that's on the bar here. I just have to go down and highlight it, and that link is made. So it's really simple um, when working kind of intensely with the brain to do that. So I find it very, very helpful for that. And I will occasionally scroll back. Often when I'm doing demos for somebody, I'll scroll back a lot to just show them where we've been and pick up some, some thread where we were before. Okay, and uh, Diane has a question about what if any new features would be on your wish, wish list, Jerry? And then uh, Harlan, I'll let you comment on, on Jerry's wish list uh, as well since you're on the line. That's terrific, thank you. Um, so I'd like to be able to publish better, and, and um, I think we're, we're getting there. And this version um, is much better than, than, uh, than pre-personal brain four about publishing. But I, I just want to be able to um, publish the way I publish my blog. And I also, uh, and this is on the feature list, I want to be able, as I add a link, to have a checkbox um, that will automatically send that link to my delicious account, let me tag it up in that way, so that I can be not only feeding my brain, but feeding other sorts of apps. Uh, that would be great. I'm really interested in the, um, in the laying together or fusing of the brain with semantic web applications like uh, Radar Network's new thing called uh, Twine, uh, which would be really interesting because Twine ha has the semantic knowledge about, you know, this is a website, it's run by this company, this is a book, it was published by this author, et cetera, et cetera. I've got a lot of that information right here, but, I, but right this minute I can't actually manipulate it as such. Uh, not that I do a lot of queries that way, but I think it would, it would add a lot of power, and in particular it would add a lot of power to third-party users who would like to use my brain for something that they're doing. Um, then it would be really interesting also to juxtapose brains, to be able to say, you know, let's take Harlan's brain and my brain and see them side by side and see where did we give the same name and the same URL? Where did we give the same URL but different names. What did we name them differently? And, and so on and so forth, and make first, you know, various and sundry comparisons. I think that would be really interesting. And I'd like to be able to link into Harlan's uh, brain and um, from my brain link into Harlan's brain and then have the context switch and have us then start navigating through his. Uh, a long time ago, uh, early in my brain use, I, I don't know, two, three years in, I was using one of the early genealogy sites, totally separate from the brain. And I entered you know, myself and some of my family, and I was reading up on what it means to have a, 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 a certified, authenticated entry in a genealogy database, which requires birth record, death record, et cetera, et cetera. And once you do that, that person is guaranteed unique and in some sense real. And it dawned on me doing that, that at some moment I was going to enter somebody who had already been entered in the big gene genealogy database. And I was in that moment somehow connecting up to the big tree of humanity pardon the grandiose way of, of describing it, but I got a chill thinking, wow, just by sort of typing into this little database, 
I could be could sort of find my link into the big genealogical tree. That immediately translated for me into, gosh, I wish I could do that in my brain. Because I've got 86,600 thoughts uh, in my brain, and the, the, the notion of sort of uh, the social brain is really appealing to me. But I like that my brain is private. I like that my thoughts, I've created them. I like that the little cliches about category goes above, principles and product names go below, service relationships go uh, on the jump thought. That's just something I came up with. You might want to do it completely differently. But it works beautifully for me because I was able to appropriate it that way. So it's somewhere between the soft hard, the, this notion that, that the tool is soft enough for me to customize it a lot to suit my pur purposes and preferences, and yet it's got hard information in it that could be analytically useful to a lot of other people outside, which I'd like to make it you know, more so. So ways to do that. And I think that would mean using you know, RSS and XML and some other uh, regular web protocols. But those, those are some of the things I think would be uh, uh, really useful. And, um, and partly, there's other ways of, of looking at the UI that I think would be useful. I, I'd love the brain to show up just floating on a page. When I, when I see something and highlight it, I'd like to be able to have that be linkable into my brain. And, and Harlan, we can talk about that uh, some other time, too. So Harlan, that do you want to talk about this? Sure. <coughs> Let me uh, let me uh, comment on a few of the things that Jerry said here. Uh, Jerry, you've, you've touched on uh, a lot of, uh, of functionality uh, at a pretty uh, pretty deep level there. So uh, some of the things that, uh, or most of the things that Jerry's been talking about, are things that we've actually been working on for some time. Um, one of the things that uh, people will notice about Personal Brain Four uh, is that uh, each thought in Personal Brain Four has its own uh, globally unique ID if you look on the on the details tab and um, while that doesn't may not seem very significant uh, when you're just using the program on your desktop um, it is uh, pretty significant in terms of the architectural uh, path forward uh, to being able to make uh, thoughts unique across the entire world and uh, between different users so that <clears throat> when you are able to put your brain online um, in a more direct fashion than, than you can today, which is something that we're working on right now, of course, um, you will be able to then make links between your brain and somebody else's brain and have those two things um, interconnect more directly. Um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, sort of major uh, features that... Uh, we're working on now for uh, for the future of personal brain is the ability to have two brains that can actually talk to each other and sort of synchronize between each other. Um, this addresses uh, one of the questions that's uh, come up since by uh, from Dave Clark. Um, right now, <clears throat> there's no way to synchronize two brains um, beyond uh, sort of using a file level synchronization. But um, the uh, the sort of uh, underlying uh, structure for enabling that type of functionality is built into Personal Brain 4. And the reason is that uh, not only do we want to be able to have people synchronize their brains from their notebook to their PC or to their work uh, desktop, um, but also we want people to be able to synchronize brains between uh, two different users so that one user can have uh, a thought which was passed to them from another user. And you can sort of see the beginnings of that type of functionality in the copy and paste functionality, which allows one to, uh, to share and, and merge and, um, and synchronize uh, uh, things through a uh, uh, sort of a more manual process at the moment. But um, yeah, so the, uh, the ability to, to be able to take brains and put them online really opens up a whole new universe of possibilities in terms of interconnecting brains, uh, comparing brains, and having the concepts which are uh, represented by thoughts uh, become uh, sort of real, as, as Jerry uh, alluded to with the, uh, the ancestry uh, reference, <clears throat> so that one person could, uh, could create a, a concept of self-publishing, for example, looking at Jerry's brain. And uh, that same concept might be referenced from other people's brains and can be sort of disambiguated so that uh, one connection uh, in one brain can be uh, um, sort of 
imported or referenced automatically from another brain that uh, that talks about the same concept. And and Harlan and Jaren, I, I, that ties into some of our more advanced questions. And, and Cece, I haven't uh, forgotten about your questions. Uh, uh, Conrad Claiborne, who actually has a very, very large brain himself in the uh, telemedicine, uh, venture capital, and uh, educational space, uh, had some questions uh, for Jerry and, and Harlan as well about uh, what your thoughts were on publishing with wiki RSS as a mechanism to feed personal brain. Right. The, uh, the ability to publish uh, brains as, uh, as wikis and uh, RSS feeds um, or with inputs rather from uh, from um, uh, inputs and outputs uh, from RSS feeds is also something that will uh, sort of tie into the whole ability to take your brain and, and put it online. Um, some of the uh, uh, the sort of main fundamentals of being able to do that, of course, are being able to have URLs for every thought inside your brain. Um, and when you uh, when you publish your brain today uh, through the SiteBrain uh, export facility, um, it does assign uh, URLs to to thoughts. Um, however, it, they're not um, uh, they're not permanent in that when you publish your brain, you can publish it to many different servers. Um, but uh, we're moving toward a sort of a centralized uh, service so that you could more easily have a single URL which refers to your thought uh, sort of no matter where it is. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's also something uh, for the future. And uh, Jerry, I think this question is, is coming back to you, but uh, it, it's from Dave Clark about uh, whether or not you use your brain on a PC and notebook, and if so, do you synchronize the two? I, I have always worked with only one machine, uh, Dave, so I've, I've avoided the issues of, of having to sync my brain in different locations or anything like that. I've been lucky that way. And Harlan, maybe uh, just to, to answer uh, Dave's question, you could talk a little bit about um, uh, working across multiple platforms and uh, using your brain on a USB drive, which I know has been uh, popular with uh, a lot of the Personal Brain 4.0 users. Yeah, there's a few ways to, uh, to address that. One is just to use a, a single machine, as, as Jerry has done. Um, the other way is to um, put your brain on a uh, USB drive, which you can then attach to any computer to, uh, to access the, uh, the information. If you actually do want to have two copies of your brain, um, the, uh, there, it is possible to synchronize two different brains so that um, when your changes are made in, uh, in one system, they're propagated to the other. Um, however, it's, uh, it's not something that we recommend because you have to make sure that you only make changes in one system at a time before you do the synchronization. Mm -hmm. um, we are, uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we are working on the ability to, uh, to synchronize brains in a more flexible way, but, uh, but that's not something that's ready at this time. Okay, great. And then, Jerry, just to, in terms of a few other areas that I've personally uh, found useful, I was wondering if uh, we still have well, uh, five more minutes left on our session here, if you could take us through uh, some of your the marketing section in your brain. Uh, myself, as a marketing professional, I will regularly go into Jerry's brain when I'm searching for a new PR firm or outsourcing uh, work, and um, just for the, since there are a number of you in marketing or within the technology space, um, just uh, as a, a resource for you, uh, I myself have, have found that helpful. And Harlan, I know you are also using Jerry's Brain as well. If you have any other areas that you'd like our users to, to, to know about, just as simply a reference for them for their own uh, business activity. Um, yeah, so um, I care a lot about marketing. I care a lot about how people communicate and how people make decisions uh, and how change happens. So I've been fleshing this out sort of not consciously, just again, this happens a little bit everywhere all the time. 
Uh, so there's lots of things. And oh, actually, that reminds me of that reminds me of another uh, big and interesting subclass of things that I do in my brain. Uh, so I have types of marketing here: marketing to children, marketing to elders, marketing to Latinos, marketing to teens, to women, mass marketing, mobile marketing, network marketing, neural marketing, permission marketing, the Seth Godin stuff, and so forth. And this will, of course, lead you back up to Seth Godin. Um, types of marketing. Uh, four rules. Here's Seth Godin. Four rules of permission marketing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what's interesting here is that at one point it dawned on me that I had a lot of types. So I created a thought called types, and this is another one of the most interesting thoughts uh, I think in my brain. You know, types of bank, types of beer, types of bicycle, types of clothes, types of commu of commerce, types of content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that became a really interesting way to uh, to go through, and um, and just to, if you let me follow this digression uh, just for a moment, I also ended up finding things like um, for some reason my machine is deciding to slow down a little bit. Uh, variants of capitalism, compassion of capitalism, uh, consumer capitalism, disaster capitalism from Naomi Klein's new book, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and also types of democracy. There's a ridiculous number of theories and models uh, of democracy that are pretty interesting. Adversary democracy, augmented democracy, consensus, consumer, continuous, deep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I can uh, go back to marketing. Um, the PR list shows up because the way that companies contact people like me for years and years has been they hire a PR firm and the PR people play intermediary. So I used to make those links, and I know a lot of the PR people, and the PR people learn to use me well and and I learned to you know, stay in touch with them. So um, I, one thing I don't have in here, which would be actually really hard to do, is any kind of ratings on these things. Um, it would be interesting, for example, to pull into any book I have linked to Amazon. And, and uh, on book links, I will mostly link to the Amazon page. It would be really interesting to pull up if I had linked them, or, or let's say movies I have rated on Netflix. It would be interesting to reflect that in the brain rather than have to follow the link out to Netflix. And I actually don't have any movie links into Netflix uh, in my brain. I'm realizing that. But there's other sorts of things that might let you say which are the PR firms I think are the best. But on reflection, it would, that would be hard for me to say. And it would be hard for me to consistently report in ratings that would be useful that way. So better for me if you can just search through it and find out who they represented because you can see the links. And also, Send me email. If you have a question about, about something you found in, in, in my brain, send me email, and I will learn something from that email. And something else will get. You know, I'll put something else in my brain as a result of that email. And that's the feedback loop I'd like to have. And Jerry, can you uh, just repeat your email address uh, for everyone uh, on the call today? Sure. It's Jerry at associate.com, and I will put it in the chat as well. Jerry at S-O-C-I-A-T-E dot com. So it should be on the chat. Um, if you go to associate dot com, you'll see links to my online brain, to my blog, to a bunch of other stuff. Uh, that should work out fine. And Jerry, given that your brain is has been viewed by so many people, have you had any um, uh, controversial thoughts or topics in your brain? Any feedback on on something that was in your brain that that uh, was either miscategorized or uh, has struck a, struck a chord uh, with your audience? Um, well. You can you can derive my political views pretty easily from looking at uh, um, at my brain. So if you were to go to the Bush administration uh, thought <coughs> and then look underneath it, uh, stuff about Iraq, stuff about you know Scooter Libby and his trial, uh, John McGraponte, Josh Bolton, all these people are here. I'm, I'm hoping you can see them on the WebEx right now. Yes, That's we can see them. And actually, Jerry, you can make your brain maybe a little longer. Uh, if possible, because we do have a little bit more room to see even more of your thoughts. That would be great. Yeah. I made it short because I always uh, leave the icon in the browser exposed so I can drag icons into the brain, but you're right. Oh, I see. Okay, here. great. But, but, but that's the reason I always keep it that size mm -hmm. is uh, I go there. So smart desktop, I will, I will look at that later. Thanks, James. Um, so here's my brain. So, so you can see um, a lot of stuff around the Bush administration, but mm -hmm. you know, I haven't received many notes about this and, and so forth. Part of it is that the, 
uh, not enough people know that my brain exists online, and the link to sort of message me back and all that isn't uh, isn't all that crisp and clear. So, Interesting. If you have any uh, thoughts on uh, your the Christmas holidays or preparing for uh, Hanukkah or the uh, the Christmas uh, season, anything that uh, relates to the upcoming holidays. Um, any thoughts in, in my brain for those things? Yes. Um, sort of. Not a whole lot. I haven't, uh, you know, I've got a holiday thought and stuff like that. Um, let me go there. And, you know, places to go to uh, links for holiday schedules and this and that. But I, I haven't put a lot of things in for, for the season. Sorry, something's making my system a bit slower now. Okay, well, I think um, that um, I think we've we've caught most of the, the uh, questions and exceeded the session by uh, thirty minutes. So I guess um, if anyone has any uh, final questions, uh, please get them in the next couple uh, minutes. And uh, Jerry, uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave it to you as far as any uh, closing notes or uh, last minute uh, tips or advice you have for both new and uh, experienced brain users. Um, sure. And just for everybody's amusement uh, who's still on the call, I just went to the, the special holiday of Festivus, which comes out of the Seinfeld show where we're supposed to do amazing uh, feats of strength and the airing of grievances, which seems to me to be a pretty good formula for stuff. Um, <laughs> That's great. I, I just, um, it, uh, on reflection, and I've reflected a few times, I've got an essay I'm going to post to my blog uh, that I did for, as a revisit to the newsletter I used to write, Release 1.0. So I'm going to post that, which is you know, what I've learned from 10 years of using my brain. And um, part of it is that a little bit like when I played too much Tetris, and I would go to, I, I learned that I had to stop playing Tetris when I would go to sleep at night and close my eyes, and I, uh, on the inside of my eyelids I would see the little blocks descending. Um, I will be in conversation with somebody and they'll say something and I'll realize, oh, wow, I, that's not in my brain yet. Um, so I will realize that I need to put it in. So I'll take a little note and then I'll harvest those notes out and put them in my brain. So, um, so um, that has been a pretty important part of, of my life now for 10 years. And I feel like I've got a little hidden advantage on remembering stuff that because I've been pretty organized about this, that, that it allows me to find things that have mattered to me. Um, so I feel like I have a better, more organized uh, access to my context, my historic context. And I don't want that statement to scare people off from using something like the brain, because it was useful after I had 50 or 100 thoughts in it. Just the mere, the mere ability to find something more quickly than finding it in your bookmarks list in your browser was a big deal. Um, that, that I thought was uh, you know, significant right at the beginning, and also, it's the process of building your brain and deciding how you're going to organize different sorts of patterns. That process is really joyful. It's really um, sort of happy, and you feel like you're doing something really beneficial. So um, I think that was a, a big help as well. So with that, I just want to thank you guys for, for having the, uh, this, uh, this webinar. It's been a pleasure answering questions, and fun to see everybody on the call. Thank you, Shelley and Harlan. All right. Well, thank you, Jerry. Uh, we appreciate you opening up your, uh, your brain and your thinking uh, to the world. And again, thanks for everyone who is attending. And uh, for those of you that want to see more of Jerry's brain, please go to uh, associate.com. Um, we'll also post a link for Je of Jerry's brain right off our homepage today so you can get to it really easier. You can go to thebrain.com uh, forward slash Jerry's brain. And that will uh, conclude our session. And uh, thanks for joining today, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks, bye bye. Jerry. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.